In 2008, when the US subprime crisis hit, it hit the people of Greece incredibly hard. This was not because the people of Greece had done anything wrong. It was simply because of the way capitalism works, or in the case of the working class, doesn't work. It was a result of the speculative nature of finance capital and the greed of the Greek bourgeoisie and the European bourgeoisie. It was evident at this time that Greek banks were highly exposed to debt. It seemed, after all, there's no such thing as easy money. As the economy retracted, sovereign debt increased, as did unemployment, and so on and so on. While many other countries stimulated their economy to encourage growth, the ECB, or the European Central Bank, encouraged austerity in Greece. This was in addition to the steady implementation of austerity since 2004. By 2010, the debt burden had increased and unemployment reached 13%, the highest in the EU. The solution presented by the Troika, which is the European Commission, the International Monetary Fund and the European Central Bank was the Memorandum of Understanding or what became known as Memorandum Number 1. In exchange for a loan of 148 billion euros, the public sector was to be substantially cut, pensions were to be cut, wages frozen and so on. Also taxes were increased, the energy sector was liberalised and, and other industries were deregulated and the road for privatisation was paved. Needless to say, this only exacerbated the crisis. By 2012, unemployment had reached a record high of 25% and youth unemployment reached 30%. The solution to this deepening crisis was Memorandum of Understanding number two. With, you guessed it, more austerity. The result, an even deeper recession. I might add that at this time, this was um, the second memorandum was implemented by a technocratic government. Uh, the initial one was implemented by um, the Papandreou government of PASOK, a so-called social democratic uh, party. Um, who were ousted and replaced by a technocratic government. This 100 billion, dollar, sorry, 100 billion euro bailout package came with more public sector cuts, uh, job losses, pension cuts, tax increases, and you guessed it, privatisations. It resulted in the closure of over 2,000 schools. And those schools that were left open were operating without heating in the freezing cold. It resulted in hospital closures, leaving only 80 hospitals across Greece to care for 11 million people. As a result of increases to emergency admission costs, many went without medical treatment when needed, and this is still, I believe, the case. Or well, certainly was up until recently. Um, ultimately, the reason why the crisis deepened was a result of the euro currency. Greece was at the mercy of the euro, a currency ultimately controlled by Germany as the richest European country. To understand the crisis, one must understand how it is ultimately the result of the euro currency. At the end of the day, it ultimately had, I exaggerate slightly, but nothing to do with Greece or any characteristic of the people of Greece or that they particularly like to have long coffee breaks or, you know, long whatever strolls along the beach or whatever it is that the Greeks do differently to everyone else. All of that's a, a, a stereotype. In fact, the statistics in Greece are they um, work amongst the longest hours in Europe, had the fewest uh, holidays in Europe and were amongst um, the, the, the lowest paid in Europe as well. So the reality was that Greeks worked extremely hard and I think those that are working still are. Um, so ultimately it's a result of being in the Euro and fundamentally the undemocratic nature of the Eurozone. If Greece had the drachma, for example, if it hadn't joined the euro, I think it's safe to say that um, it, would it would have probably still been hit by the subprime crisis, maybe not as bad, uh, most likely not as bad. Um, it would have been able to lower interest rates and implement quantitative easing. Um, and over time, it potentially could have worked itself into its in out of the crisis or implemented a greater control as opposed to this runaway uh, debt that was placed upon it. With the Euro, it is Northern Europe that is pulling the strings for its own economic benefit. The whole Eurozone is rotten to the core and Greece should never have been accepted in it is, is the fact and we know 
you know, it's all been revealed since that the books were fudged to allow Greece into the Eurozone. It's, it's you know, not a particularly well-hidden secret and Greece was brought into the Eurozone purely for the benefit of um, Northern Europe. Um, the subprime crisis left the German banks exposed through the Greek banks um, and to a lesser extent the French banks. The private bank sector debts were simply shifted onto the working class of, of Greece. And I think that's what we have to understand is that this crisis had nothing to do with the working class of Greece or anything they had done. It's simply the result of um, global capital and that this debt had to go, had to be paid by someone and it's being paid by the working class of Greece. So let me move on to the massive resistance to austerity from the, Greece. It was from the Greeks. It was clear to say that the Greeks did not take this laying down. Since 2010, Greece has had around 30 general strikes, with the most recent one actually taking place a few weeks ago on the 12th of November. The street resistance has been relatively sustained and highly visible for a number of years. Pensioners, students, farmers, um, I think every public sector has had protests um, within Greece. And that's across Greece, not just in Athens. In May 2011, the Occupy the Square movement began, largely inspired by the Spanish Indignados movement. The occupations were largely peaceful. Um, so we saw some very inspiring images at the time of large scale occupations of the squares throughout the major cities um, throughout Greece. Um, and ultimately, uh, this, this movement was shut down, uh, violently shut down by, by police. Uh, the People's Assemblies, or Open Assemblies, in the squares of Greece used direct democracy and self-organising structures. Over three million people participated in these protests. That's around about 23% of the population. In smaller towns, and I'll give you uh, a, an example um, from my family, um, in, in a... In a town, an industrial mm -hmm. town of Megalopoli, in, in pretty much the centre of the, the Peloponnese, um, there were weekly protests every Friday in the town square. So Friday is market day, so everyone comes out to do their, their shopping in, in, the, in the town square. So, um, you know, it was a chance to, to protest. Through this movement, Citiza began to emerge as a real political force. Small, bro um, broad, grassroots, radical coalition established itself as a real alternative and political leader of the anti-austerity resistance. Although it had parliamentary representation from 2004, from this period on, Citizen grew substantially in membership and support. In the two 2012 election, Citizen emerged as a second party, winning 27% of the vote, up from 4.6 in 2009. Uh, meanwhile, the Social Democratic PASOK, who, as I said, implemented the first memorandum, was smashed and received only 12%. Throughout this time, Citizen campaigned vocally against austerity. Also, the crisis continued to deepen in Greece. By February 2014, unemployment reached 28% and youth unemployment reached around 50%. So you can only imagine the, the, the massive social impact um, austerity's had on the vast majority of Greek society, that if you have one in four or more than one in four unemployed and only one in two young people employed, that it's quite feasible that within a family, let's say a family of four people, that you would only have one income coming in. And you could just think of what that would mean to your own life as a young person to not have any money, to not have money to go out, have coffee with your friends, uh, to not be able to go to a movie, yeah, it's very touching when I was in Athens uh, in January. Some very touching stories of the cleaners that were, were sacked and were staging a, a picket, an ongoing picket to, to get their jobs back. Um, of, of this woman, Khara was her name, who talked about exactly that. She had lost her job, her husband had lost her job, her uh, eldest daughter had lost her job and her other daughter still had a job. And the, she, she talked about how awkward it was for her older daughter that she couldn't have a social life. She couldn't go out for coffee with her friends because she didn't have two euros to spend on a coffee. 
So you could imagine the, the, the mental impact it would have. I know I would certainly start to feel depressed and, and worse if, if that was my life overnight changed so dramatically. She talked about how she and her husband used to go out on, on the odd date to a movie or out for a dinner, and that was no longer an option. So, you know, the real impact is, is quite um, dramatic. Um, So Syriza was able to use its parliamentary representation to campaign against austerity. With Greece being in recession now for six years and under memorandum for four and suffering harsh austerity measures, the reality of austerity was having a huge impact on Greek society and living standards. As I gave you a few anecdotes, the 2013 Global Misery End Index had Greece ranked number 10 out of 90 cu countries. To give you some some context. Um, so a country that, that, you know, so for example, suicide was not a big issue in Greece, it now is. Problems like prostitution were not major issues in, in Greece. Um, and now they are particularly um, amongst mi young migrant women. Um, and of course the, the, you know, children and the, the you know, all of that side of things of the, the sex industry, and particularly that being coming migrant children, being o young mi migrant women in particular being over, you know, uh, that's really where the issue um, lies there. So these were issues that didn't exist uh, five, six years ago. In 2013, 32% of Greeks were defined as living in poverty, with 21% of children malnourished. Again, we're talking about third world issues coming to a, you know, what was, okay, not an advanced capitalist economy, but, uh, you know, this is a country in the Eurozone, in, um, you know, more or less aligned with Western Europe. It was also out of the occupation of the squares movement that the solidarity for all movement emerged. To me, it seemed very inspired by the Venezuelan missions the solidarity movement is fundamentally about dignity. It organises at local levels and relies on donations of goods rather than cash. It organises resistance around the basic needs of community and its people. Solidarity structures exist in the areas of health, food, education, culture, housing and debt, legal support, social and alternative economy, workers and immigrant solidarity and international, solid international solidarity. And, and it's interesting because you suddenly had all these skilled workers unemployed with time on their hands. So you had all these teachers and healthcare workers who had been sacked from the public sector with nowhere else to go. Um, and thankfully, thankfully for, for them, um, they've been able to contribute and join in with the solidarity movement and play a political role, um, not only assist those in, in, in desperate need. Um, this movement is not just about providing a service that the state no longer does, but it's about mobilising and empowering community. The work that these activists do is life and death. They make a real difference um, and they fight for human dignity. And I don't exaggerate that. We you know, were heard many stories, particularly in the health section, um, the, the health solidarity campaign, where really what they did was save people's lives. Um, and it's terrible to think that this can happen in a country over such a short period of time that you can go from having health care and free health care to suddenly not being able to afford medicines or, um, you know, afford to go to, to have a car accident and you can't afford to go to um, the hospital because you have to cough up 25 euros. Um, you know, these are very, fri very frightening um, change to, within Greek society. The solidarity campaign is still continuing and I remember in January when I was there talking to, to the people at this <coughs> clinic in, in Petisteti who had hoped, um, who had said that certainly when, if a city's the government gets in, we reckon we'll only be here for about another year at most, maybe less. And you know, it does break my heart to think that that's certainly not the, the situation and one can only imagine um, the hardship that they're going through. Um, so, you know, I do think the solidarity campaign is something to, to keep an eye on because it is playing a real role within communities and it's playing a real role within those, the most disadvantaged working class communities of, 
of throughout Greece, but particularly the larger cities of Athens and Thessaloniki um, and so forth. And I think they, they will play a, a, a very important role um, in terms of providing a base and rebuilding the socialist left, but, but time will tell. There was also the wide-scale opposition to the unfair property taxes, or the ENFIA. Um, ENFIA, put simply, is a uniform property tax based on dated and fictitious property value. So even land that is vacant and not generating any property is subject to, to this tax. While as socialists, we wouldn't per se object to property taxes, um, the problem here is that there is no adjustment based on one's ability to pay. So first of all, the, it's completely unfair how they come up with what the, the tax is, but two, there's no adjustment. It doesn't matter if you're unemployed, it doesn't matter if um, you're a pensioner or what it is. You've got property, you have to pay your tax. Hence, it has bankrupted and imprisoned many poor and working poor for their inability to pay. The taxes were initially implemented as a temporary tax, a result of de declining income tax <coughs> revenue. So, of course, when suddenly a quarter of your population is unemployed, it's inevitable that your income tax base is going to go down. Um, you know, and I guess this is proof that, well, you know what, Greeks actually paid their taxes. Um, here's your evidence. Um, the issue, of course, was that the rich Greeks didn't pay their taxes. Um, so, and after five name changes, this has become a permanent tax, and to my understanding, um, I think it's there to remain till the end of 2016, although it was one of Citizens' platform policies to abolish this tax. Um, the ENFIA has raised government revenues on property for, from 500 million euros to about 3.5 billion euros. So you can see in terms of revenue raising, it's a very successful tax but has come at enormous social cost. While Enfia didn't quite bring the masses to the streets, it had an enormous social impact on the middle class. And this has been a key part of the large scale support to Citiza. So uh, this section I think largely abandoned um, PASOK in particular um, and New Democracy, the Conservatives. So there's obviously a layer has, has swung away from that um, sort of conservative side or you know, however you want to, well, we'll throw PASOK in with the conservatives, they're not exactly progressives, um, but that traditional social democratic base um, shifted away uh, and towards the left, um, towards a conscious left vote um, for, for Syriza. Um, I, I'll, just, I'll just touch on, and I feel free to raise it in discussion if, you, if you'd like to, but the rise of Golden Dawn, uh, for those of you who don't know, but Golden Dawn is a far-right fascist party. Um, I think Golden Dawn does represent a resistance to austerity. It's not how we would like it, but it does tap into um, that desperation, the, the search of people for something else. Um, they certainly did a lot in terms of building their base uh, by doing uh, food distribution and so forth. So certainly in the, air, the suburbs where they were strong, I have no doubt they, they won a lot of people or a portion of people over because they were out there on the streets giving food to the poor, to the hungry, when no one else was. Um, we know, of course, that that comes with very strong strings attached. Um, the horrific racism, the violence towards uh, migrants, um, the bashing of migrants, and of course the, the, the murder of um, the, the, the singer or rapper, the left-wing um, performer. Um, politically though, I think Golden Dawn have been held in place. Certainly the September elections didn't show any, any growth. Um, within Golden Dawn. So that's a positive thing that they, they're sitting at that same 6% rate. Um, you know, it's still 6% more than I guess we would like them to have, but, but nonetheless, they haven't grown massively. They're not representing a far right shift in Greek politics. Um, but it will be interesting to see in, in the next couple of years if that changes. I suspect it won't, um, but time will tell. Um, I won't go into the refugee crisis because that's a whole other discussion, but again, feel free to, to raise it in discussion if you'd like. Um, now, I want to talk about Citiza because I imagine that has been confusing for many of us in the room, um, if not shocking, 
and disappointing. Certainly the events that have, take, um, that have taken place uh, since the high of the January 25 elections and particularly since the, the referendum in July 5. Um, it was evident at the time and even more so with the wisdom of hindsight that the Troika and European states such as Germany, Holland and Finland, etc., were not keen on, f on the fighting anti-austerity approach of Syriza. Um, and they were certainly were not keen on the then finance mi minister, Yanis Varoufakis. Um, the referendum on July 5 was an extraordinary moment in recent history. Uh, here we, I know I certainly felt very excited by it at the time and thought, wow, this is an example of what the left can do in power, that you've got the entire European bourgeoisie against you on this tiny little country that really doesn't have any global significance in terms of the economy whatsoever. It's a tiny economy in Europe. It's a tiny economy on the global scale. Um, yet it had the entire weight of the European bourgeoisie bearing down upon it, along with its own bourgeoisie, um, you know, it had called in the heavies and 61% of Greeks stood up and said no. You know, said no, we're not, we're not going to take this. Uh, we don't want austerity. However, it was almost the next day or three days later, we, we then saw Alexis Tsipras make a horrific deal. And, you know, if you're like me, scratching your head, kind of going, the fuck's just happened? <laughs> How did we go from that to uh, effectively giving up sovereignty, which is what they've done? So Greece no longer, you know, has sovereignty. They've give the, they, they are now ruled by the Troika and um, a fourth institution thrown in as well. Um, and if you read the memorandum, it basically says now, you know, I paraphrase, but the gist of it is, it's in more corporate legal terms, but the gist of it is if you, um, you can't take anything to Parliament uh, without consulting with us first. Okay, so as far as I can see, that's conceding um, sovereignty. You're, you, you're not gov governing um, for the people, you're governing for the European elite. Um, this was followed very quickly by the purging of the far left of Syriza, the, the, the left platform. And this wasn't necessarily because <coughs> of their, their policies or what the left... Oh, I think I've left something out there. Um, I think the, the left platform were outmaneuvered by the right wing of Syriza. Um, oh, sorry, no, I've left something out there. Da, 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 da. Uh, yes, yeah, so the purging of the, of the far left within Syriza, the left platform, who, um, who took a principled stand and said, look, we, we can't possibly implement further austerity. We've just spent how many years campaigning uh, uh, against it? Everything about it is wrong. How on earth can we in good consciousness um, pass more austerity that we know, that we know will only hurt people? Um, so they were purged from... from uh, the party and formed their, a new party, Popular Unity, um, which was rendered, unfortunately, um, electorally irrelevant in the September elections. It did not receive a th the 3% vote needed to gain parliamentary um, representation. And interestingly, um, you know, they, they took initially a strong, the, the position which they had all along, which was we should leave the Eurozone and return to the drachma. Um, and it was very interesting to see the right of Syriza um, and Tsipras, we'll throw him in there too, collaborated with, with the media um, to make the position of return to the drachma seem like an impossible one. Um, I'll come back to the drachma thing briefly. Um, what this experience highlights is the limitation of electoralist politics. Uh, there needed to be a lot more done to link Syriza with the grassroots campaigns um, and to popularise an alternative to the Eurozone. Cities have failed to present and popularise an alternative. And really, it had at least three years to do so. For three years, it was the second largest party in government. It had ample time to popularise, hey, you know, let's return to the drachma, this is why, etc. whatever the, the alternative, the plan B um, was to be. I believe they tried to implement the Thessaloniki program 
um, at every turn. And I believe they tried, and really, I think they succeeded in highlighting the undemocratic nature of the Eurozone. I don't think it's quite as simple to say they sold out, um, although it might quite uh, appear like that. Um, I know a lot on the left say, see, we told you, we you knew this was going to happen. Um, the prophecy has come true. Um, that's how good we are. We've got it right. You know, I think, and, you know, I, I caric being a caricaturing it a bit, but it wasn't far off that. Certainly conversations I had, posts on, on Facebook, there was almost a celebration of, yay, it failed. <laughs> And you kind of think, what the fuck is wrong with you? How can you celebrate that? You know, we should be asking, where did it go wrong? How can, you know, where does the left go now? How can we avoid such errors in the future? Um, you know, how do we work together? Um, <coughs> it's, it's also probably true to say that we, maybe a socialist alliance, um, and resistance underestimated the strength of the right in Syriza. Um, you know, I think we're certainly aware of the complexities of Syriza as an organisation and that the, there was a conservative element within Syriza. It's not true to say that, you know, we knew they have, have everything right, but then again, it's not our position to say, you know, yay, do this, do that. Uh, we know better. Um, Certainly, at the time that Syriza implemented the Thessaloniki program in 2014, we were clear that it were, we were aware that it was a clear abandonment of their previous stronger policies. Also, that this program was not passed through the democratic structures of the party, and a whole range of other things that happened to the internal operations of the party, which you know were questionable at the time. I remember having various conversations with, with comrades and reading articles and so forth and thinking, hmm, is this a shift to the right? Um, I don't like the sounds of that, but you know, I'm not in that party, so it's not for me um, to, to say at the end of the day. Um, but again, with the wisdom of hindsight, everything becomes clear. Um, but nonetheless, I think if we were to look at the Thessaloniki program, it was a good transition policy. There's nothing, you can't look at that and go, you know what, that's shit, let's go all out, let's call for revolution now. You know, I mean, certainly in the context of politics in Greece, um, it was a good transition policy, assuming, of course, that the Troika were willing to play ball. There's the catch. Certainly, as Syriza has grown, as I said, a range of, of sus moves um, occurred. Um, I think they certainly expected that if we write a nice policy up that doesn't actually stat challenge, I think Sue, Sue in her talk, Sue Bolton in her talk, talked about how, you know, in council politics, um, but the, the managerial speak, you know, if we can create a policy that doesn't actually challenge the status quo, but still lets us ease the social burden, then surely everyone will see the wisdom in that and come our, come our way and support it. And needless to say, <laughs> the European elite don't play that game. Um, also, there was no sustained solidarity campaign in Europe to put pressure on the European elite. I think that's an important thing to recognise. You know, the Syriza and Tsipras in particular spent a lot of time, um, years, trying to build a solidarity campaign across Greece. There's the, um, what is it, the other, in Italy, the other, it's a party, the other Tsipras, what's it called? Gone blank. No, no, Podemos in Spain. The other Europe, the other Europe thank you. The other Europe with Alexis uh, Tsipras in, in Italy and so forth. So building these, um, you know, campaigns to link with the fight in Greece, to fight against austerity, pan-European um, uh, response to the struggle in Greece, to the fight against austerity, to link up with Podemos in Spain and, 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 um, and others, um, you know, left bloc in Portugal and so on. But that didn't really eventuate. Yes, sure, there were protests, people came out on the streets to show their solidarity, but it didn't cement itself in any sustained campaign to put any pressure on the European um, ruling class um, to, to force them to, to back down or change or a position in any way. 
the harsh treatment of oh sorry so let me go back so Germany and Euro and the Eurozone were ruthless um, from their position they had to be in order to maintain the status quo uh, a victory in Greece um, would equate with a victory in Spain then Ireland Portugal Scotland and so on um, the harsh treatment of Greece was pure politics nothing else so we need to be very clear that the way Greece has been treated has nothing to do with economics whatsoever. It is purely to set an example of saying to Greece, you know what, there is no alternative. You lot down in Spain, Scotland, Ireland, wherever you are, those of you popping your heads up, let's make it very clear we will quickly chop them up because there is nothing else. This is as good as it gets, so shut up and put up with it. You know, it's as blunt as that. You can't, you know, they're not nice guys. And one woman, I think. Um, so, so really, there are a number of errors with, with Syriza in how it let down the campaign against austerity. Um, you know, I guess there's a whole question of the drachma. Returning to the drachma was not in a, of itself an easy solution, albeit technically a possible one, but certainly not one without major difficulties. And it would not have ended the issue or the problems created by austerity. However, the path taken by Tsipras and those who remained in the party leadership was certainly an unprincipled one. A stronger position should have been taken by Tsipras. An alternative needed to be given to the people of Greece. Ultimately, the Thessaloniki program abandoned a plan B in preference of the hope that there would be a, dead, a debt write-off. I anticipate, here's my psychic vision, let's see if it comes true, that the Troika will cut Greece some slack. I think once this third memorandum is implemented, and over the next couple of years, I think there will be some debt write-off. Hollande has hinted at it all along, um, and I said, look, Tsipras, stick with me, you'll get it, don't worry. Um, and I think there's some truth in that, um, and it will be done in order to re-implement and secure the two-party status quo, to just bring everything back into line. Look, you've done it. You've broken down the, the left. Um, congratulations, you've taken the place of PASOK. You now have this, you have political relevance um, within boundaries, of course, that we've given you and within the decisions that we allowed you, allow you to, um, to take to, to Parliament. Um, you know, but it re-implements the status quo and just asserts everything as normal is a way of doing things. Um, That the resistance to austerity in Greece has taken a massive defeat is an understatement. That it is defeated is not true either. Thousands went out on strike on November 12 and just a few days ago pensioners were on the streets protesting against the next round of pension cuts. As the third memorandum starts to hit, Greeks will suffer even more. How they fight back, I guess we will have to wait and see and, you know, hopefully um, victory is theirs, but I think it'll be a long, tough road ahead for the people of Greece. Thank you. Thank you.